Good day, everyone, and welcome to Change Food Eats. I'm Diane Hatz. I am the founder of Change Food and also your host here at Change Food Eats. Today, our guest is Paul Willis. Paul Willis is a fifth generation family farmer and founder of the Nyman Ranch Pork Company. He has owned and operated the Willis Free Range Pig Farm in Iowa since 1975. Today, he works hard to increase opportunities for traditional, sustainable, and humane family farmers while representing the Nyman Ranch brand. Welcome, Paul Willis. So, it's so great to see you. How are you doing, especially in the co these COVID days? Doing so far, good. As you know, Iowa is a real hotbed of COVID. Uh, we were number one in the world as of yesterday, I believe. <gasps> the worst place in the, in, the, in the world to be. Uh, a lot of outbreaks, new cases and so forth, but it's- uh, And do you know uh, why? Do they know why? Uh, so lots of them at the University of Iowa and Iowa State. You know, I, I think things were just uh, uh, kind of back to school opened up and, uh, you know, people went to parties and things like that. And a lot of it came right. from there. And I think, I think uh, Iowa State was, uh, they were testing students yesterday. They were 29% positive. But you're healthy and well. I feel, you know how it is, Diane, any kind of little thing, you know? Yes. Uh, you, you think, oh, you know, something's wrong with me, but no, I feel good. Good, good. Yeah, I have to say, in like here in New York, when it was really bad, in like April and May, anytime I felt anything, I'm like, I have COVID, and I get all concerned about it. Yeah. Um, okay, so most one of the most important questions of the day, what are you eating? Well, I'm, I'm eating actually everything that's grown right here on the farm. Um, tomatoes, do you want to hear all the varieties? Heirloom tomatoes. Uh, and... give, us, give us your top three. And do you grow okay. these yourself? Yeah, I just went out and picked them so I could have these uh, to look at on the, on the call today. Uh, Ukrainian heart. Green Moldovan, German Pink, Black Crimson, Tiffin Mennonite, Tamasol, Woodley Orange, White Cherry. For that's a few, and then some basil, some opal, and some Thai basil on those, and also uh, a Japanese cucumber that I'm growing that are really great. Wow. Uh, they're called uh, Suya Taro, and then we have some. Uh, chicken baked in the oven that uh, came from the farm uh, just a couple days ago and potatoes. I'm not going to eat all this right now, but <laughs> throughout Okay, the set, can you send some, send some my way? Yeah, you want to look at it? Of course. Oh, doesn't that look yummy? So there's the heirloom tomato salad. Here's the other part. Wow. Anyway, I enjoy growing all of these things and, uh, and, you know, right out of the garden, you just can't beat it. Right, right. So let's jump in. I'm asking this question to every guest. How can we create a food system where everyone can eat healthy food? Uh, well, everybody has to be a farmer. Uh, even if you have one tomato plant on your balcony in New York, you know, there, there is something kind of... It, People that grow things really, I mean, I've seen small children go out and pull up a radish and eat it. And if it was on the table, they would never eat it. But there's a connection between the soil and, uh, and what people consume. And when they kind of understand the process and so on, you, I think it, it, it creates a personal pride in, in, in real food. You I know? agree. It's nothing like pulling up a carrot or something like that and just kind of wiping the dirt off and eating it. Totally agree. So you are or were a hog farmer from Iowa who still lives in Iowa. So tell us, like, give us a little background on you. How did you get into farming? Why hogs? Why Iowa? Okay. Uh, I grew up just a couple miles from from here, the, you've been to, to this, what we call the dream farm here with the restored prairie and everything. Anyway, I uh, moved back from Minneapolis to the farm because 
farm members needed some help. And when I, when I grew up, we had a diversified farm, but we raised hogs, pasture raised pigs. And uh, a neighbor brought over a sow, or he said, if you buy this sow, I'll just give you these pigs. Okay, and, Paul, Paul, for the yes. non, for the non hog, hog farmers, what's a sow? Uh, a sow is the mother pig. Okay. And then there's another term, guilt. That's a female pig as well, but before they actually give birth, they're called a guilt, and after they give birth, they're called a sow. Oh, why? It's a trend, trend, uh, just two terms for the different okay. females in different state. <laughs> so I, uh, I, I started keeping a few pigs, and I built up a, a herd. And I, I stayed on the farm, and I, I liked outdoor pasture-raised pigs. And I got up to the point where I was raising in the pasture, in the field, and in barns, and bedding, and so on in the winter, and marketing about 3,000 pigs a year. Wow. So this was, this was my major business, even though we were growing crops and things like this. And when was uh, this? What year? I, I started started that in the mid 70s okay in the, in the in mid to the late 70s we built and then it took a while to build these numbers up you know and uh, but anyway as we got in the mid 80s and toward 90s i was really you know i had i had uh, was growing quite a few pigs outdoors at that time uh, there were companies that were coming around and telling us uh, we had to get bigger or get out mm. and they wanted us to put up uh, what we call confined animal feeding operations. In other words, put your animals in buildings. Uh, they live on concrete, uh, liquid manure pits underneath, gestation stalls for the sows, which are basically a box that once the sow is bred, they just spend their whole life in this box. And then from there, they go to another box with a little more space on the side to the, uh, for the pigs, uh, baby pigs. And that's called a farrowing crate. And then there and were the, wean. Yeah. Oh, I just wanted to say that the for people who don't know, a confined animal feeding operation or CAFO is also called factory farm. Yes. A lot of people, I think, know the common term more. Right. Factory farm. And so I, I, I saw a couple of these uh, operations. And between the, the the you, you know it seemed to mean the animals were stressed and they were noisy and there the smell and everything was just pretty uh, horrific and uh, I just decided I was never going to raise livestock like that mm. and so I continued selling on the open market which was what everybody did basically and you sold into the commodity market and there came a time in the nineties early 90s when they uh, it became more difficult to market your hogs. They didn't want our outdoor hogs because they had more fat and because, uh, uh, you know, so they didn't yield as much as well because they, um, they had bigger heart and lungs and internal organs because of the exercise they were getting outdoors. And does anyway, that mean less meat? It, it meant that if you if you buy an animal live and then the carcass weight would be like the dressed out weight would be 73%, hmm. but these, these new other white meat would yield maybe 75% because they had more flesh, uh, but there was nothing to, nothing's, uh, talked about it when it came to quality, especially from an eating standpoint. And you had this animal living in a stressful condition and also bred to be leaner. The leaner they got, the more stressful they, uh, they seemed to be. Uh, hyper, hyper activity and, and, and all of those things ultimately led to a pork product. Uh, ultimately, we're raising food, but it led to a product that was tough and dry and tasteless. And so I, I kept doing what I was doing and then I, uh, I was in California and saw a lady buy a free range chicken and pay uh, double or maybe even triple a price. 
And I, I, I was curious about it. I asked her, well, why would she, why did she buy it? She said, well, it tastes better. And uh, I like the way it's raised. So I'm thinking, why don't we have free range pigs? Uh, nobody was talking about it. The term actually sounded odd. You know, sometimes you hear a term for the first time and it become it, it seems very strange. And then a year later, it's commonplace. Mm. So, so then I started looking around and it took me two or three years to, to actually find somebody um, who, as it turned out, was Bill Nyman, who understood that I was raising pigs, whole pigs, and I was selling whole pigs. I was not selling pork chops. Now, how did people, that come? But how exactly did that come about? Like, did he find you? Did you find him? Because wasn't he in I California? Found, you know, uh, I was in the Peace Corps, as you may know, when I was younger, and we had this kind of reunion. And I found one of my my colleagues had a ranch in Rio Vista, California, and was raising lamb. So when I was in California, I went out to visit Jeannie McCormick and her husband Al. Uh, just to see what their operation looked like and everything. It was intriguing. Uh, different type of agriculture than, uh, than we have here in Iowa. And she was telling me about, well, the lamb market fell apart. And her cousin was a chef. And her cousin introduced her to Bill Nyman that was helping market her lamb. And they were selling it. And it was going primarily to restaurants in the Bay Area. I said, well, let's call Bill. And we did. And we met the next day very all serendipitous, all kinds of luck involved. But that's how I met Bill. And we, we hit it off right away. And he said, well, send me samples. I was excited. This is the first person that really understood what I was about and, mm. and how, how we were raising livestock. So we sent it, uh, send samples to the West Coast. And it went around to Chez Panisse and other famous restaurants and they love the eating quality wow. and uh, you know when Bill told me Chez Panisse I had no idea what was that I had never heard the term or when it, you know I didn't know it was a restaurant <laughs> so, <laughs> so anyway once I've come a long ways from that time Diane so yeah so yeah. that was for people who don't know wait for people who don't know I'm in the car with Paul and we're in San Francisco we're driving to a summit thing and Paul's like oh let's go eat and he whips his phone out and just calls David Chang on his private line so like you've come a long way no that was uh, uh Charles Spahn we went to Slanted Door oh right sorry you had yeah, the no. chefs visiting you in New York right and many many chefs have been to the farm over the years too as well but right. The, the whole goal was to differentiate what I was doing as far as I possibly could from the commodity way of production. So we wanted to have animal welfare standards. Mm. We wanted to be no antibiotics ever. Uh, you know, we wanted to pay the farmer fair price, all of these things. And so all of these things I established and this, this became, you know, some of the cornerstones of, of Nyman Ranch and are still practiced today. And we pay attention to these things so it's better for the animals, better for the farmer, better for the environment, and better for the consumer. So, 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 so Nyman has a set of standards. So when people buy a Nyman Ranch product, yeah. they know that the animal was raised in a specific way? Yeah, I, I sent you a list of the standards and it's very complicated and there are lots of them, but in a nutshell, it means the animals are raised in pasture, no gestation crates, no gestation stalls, no antibiotics, you know, all kinds of things about feed and water and space and things like this. You can look it up on the website, but if you're passing in the grocery store and you see the Nyman brand, that brand represents all of those, all of those criteria and represents those farmers. And, and, you know, if you can't have the opportunity to meet a farmer in person, that brand is as close you, as you can kind of come to, to meeting a farmer, I guess, if you will. And the way and that I'm in set up, because I, I don't think a lot of people understand is you work with small family farmers dotted all over. Like I said, it's, you're not, you don't own 
all the hogs and all the farms. There are family farms. Like explain to us how it's how you the, work. The the farmers, the Nyman farmers, and, and ranchers. Uh, there are over 750 now, and over 600 hog farms. And mine was the first. And uh, the farmers own and take care of the animals. And if they meet the criteria, we agree to pay a premium price. And we look for farmers and they, you know, they have the, the Nyman criteria that they follow. Uh, so no, we don't own the pigs and contract feed them and that kind of thing. I'm very excited to share with you that this week we are starting a new segment with our health and wellness correspondent, Ebeth Johnson. Ebeth was our guest on episode three of Change Food Eat, so feel free to go back and watch that full episode if you want to get to know who she is and a little more about her. But uh, every, probably every time we do interviews, uh, we will have her on to give us some health tips. Um, she is a mindful eating coach and a well-life mentor for women. She is the founder of Delicious Living with Ebeth, as well as the breastfeeding chef. So take it away, Eva. Hello and welcome. I'm Ebeth Johnson, your mindful eating coach and wellness mentor. Today, I wanna share four simple and actionable steps we can all take to improve our health today and every day. Number one, adopt an attitude of gratitude. Approaching life with gratitude allows us to focus on the good and the great. And believe me, no matter how hard life is, there are always, always things to be grateful for. My favorite way to deepen into gratitude is with a daily gratitude journal. At the end of the day, I write down 10 things for which I am grateful. And if you decide to practice this, I encourage you to try to find 10 new things every single day because there's just that much to be grateful for every day. Number two, eat veggies for breakfast. Adding veggies to your breakfast plate is a wonderful way to improve your health and increase your energy. Non-starchy veggies like asparagus and broccoli and mixed greens flood our body and our brain with the nutrients we need to thrive. Plus, the fiber in veggies, it feeds the beneficial bacteria in our gut, improving our digestion and supporting our immune system. Even better, eating veggies for breakfast imbues our cells with energy while setting the stage for fewer sugar cravings later in the day. This means we can say bye-bye to those 3 p.m. sweet treats that so many of us could really go without. Number three, get sweaty and breathless for at least 20 minutes per day. Now notice that I did not say exercise for 20 minutes, and that's because I know that for some of us, the word exercise can have a somewhat negative connotation, bringing to mind boring, grueling, punishing workouts at the gym. And I don't wanna evoke any of those ideas. I do want to open our minds to the wide variety of ways we can become sweaty and breathless in and out of the gym. We can dance or swim or spin, walk or hike, belly dance or pole dance, or one of my favorites, we can roller skate. No matter your method, commit to getting sweaty and breathless for at least 20 minutes per day. Bonus points if you get it done in the morning. Doing your movement practice in the morning boosts your energy and your focus and your metabolism for the rest of the day. Finally, number four, connect with your community. Our community of friends and family are a vital part of our health and wellness journey. We need loving relationships with people who lift us up when we're down, who reflect our greatness when we don't see it within ourselves, and who inspire us to want to be greater. Maintaining these relationships takes some energy and effort and enthusiasm. So I encourage you every day to reach out and connect to at least one person in your membership circle, in your community, and have a great conversation. Have some full belly laughs. 
because these nourishing and nurturing relationships are vital to our health. So as you put these four practices into momentum in your life, we would love to hear from you. We'd love to know how you are practicing gratitude, how you're putting veggies on your plate, how you're getting sweaty and breathless, and how you're staying in touch with your friends. Leave us a note in the comments and let us know. I'm Yvette Johnson. I'm sending you love and light and deliciousness always, and I'll see you next time. Probably the biggest event in food happened in 2015 when Nyman sold to Purdue. Um, and there was a lot of trepidation from people. It's been five years. So can you just tell us like what happened and then sort of where things are today? Nyman Ranch started out basically Bill Nyman. And he had a partner, Orville Shell, who exited a long time ago. And then he, he brought in a few more partners. And then later they were bought out by Venture Capital Group. And there were additional investors. It became Natural Foods Hold, Holdings Company. And they also bought Supreme Pack in Iowa. And Venture Capital, as you probably know, are when they uh, acquire a uh, a business, their goal is to make, keep it for a little while and then sell it. Right. So we ultimately, we knew Nyman Ranch, uh, somebody was going to buy it. And very fortunately, Purdue be, became interested and did buy Nyman Ranch. Now, I, I didn't realize the importance of the fact that Purdue is a family company but it's different than a publicly traded company by the fact that it's not be, you know, all about short-term gain. And we have not changed anything we're doing at all, except we have more money to make improvements and do things like that because of the affiliation with Purdue. But, and I, I've gotten to know Jim Purdue well, and I have to say, and also, my kind of goal in the back of my mind was to change the way, the way America eats. And you need some big players to do that. You can't do it just in the farmer's market. And so they, Purdue, looked at Nyman Ranch and they were very, you know, uh, impressed and intrigued by, you know, some of the, um, the pillars of what we were doing. And I have to tell you, they've adopted a lot of those things into the bigger company. More emphasis on, uh, on animal welfare. Uh, they have uh, brought in several animal welfare groups from around the country to ask them, invite them to come to Purdue, sit down at the table. Uh, I think everybody was a little nervous about this, but it's gone very, very well in the fact that, you know, people are talking to each other and improving things. Also, uh, farmer councils, you probably know I've had a, a, an advise, Nyman Ranch Farmer Advisory Board for, for years, mm -hmm. and they basically adopted that, uh, and they have advisory boards of their poultry farmers. So I honestly couldn't be more pleased it's been a real positive thing all, all the way around. Yeah, I, I mean, I have to say, I think 10 years ago, I would have had a huge issue with something like a Purdue buying a Nyman. When it happened, it's like, uh, but now it's not just inevitable. I think that people have to be realistic and, and know that they have to they have to look at reality and that a company like Purdue buying Nyman can be beneficial. Like it's not the evil giant coming to change. They actually took what you've done and are incorporating it into them. So I think that there's a shift going on in food is what I'm saying. And that it's not the big guy versus the little guy. It's not black or white, good or bad. So, so anyway, switching gears, are you still farming? Uh, no, I, uh, I have a, a young man that's um, farming our crop ground, and he has been farming organically for a number of years. Now, do you, so, do you lease the land to him as a farmer, or is he? Yeah, 
Yeah, he rents the land from me. That's fantastic. Is it true that you work to restore native grasslands? Like uh, well, it's the uh, native prairie uh, it, in Iowa is less than one tenth of one percent. That means that's that's land that's never had a plow in it. Uh, it's in its natural state, so it's very rare. In in two thousand two, the the uh, wetland reserve, which is a federal program, uh, was an opportunity to put land, especially a little bit on the marginal side put it in a restored or reconstructed uh, native prairie. And this is the area is a prairie pothole region. Uh, a lot of glacial, there were a lot of little ponds and, and, and sloughs and wetlands but that, it, that had been drained for the purposes of raising corn, basically. Mm. Anyway, this was an opportunity to reverse that, to restore the wetlands and to plant uh, prairie or through burning and practices, restore the existing, they were like pastures or places. So this farm, 160 acres, and, and it's a very dynamic uh, area. I've had, last year I had trumpeter swans nest here for the first time in probably over 125 years. Wow. Uh, and, and, um, Sandhill cranes have returned here uh, after over 120 years. Anyway, it's those kind of things are exciting to me. Uh, it, and why are and they? It is a permanent easement. You cannot farm this ground, and it will remain uh, in in this uh, restored state. And, and why are you so excited about these birds coming back? Is somebody a birder? Yeah, I, I, I watch birds all the time. I mean, outdoors, you don't, it's not like something you have to go and do, so to speak. You can just do it as you're outside. Oh, you don't so travel right around? Now, well, I, I went to Costa Rica in the winter, looked for the great green macaw. Did you find it? Okay, so yes. Kate Saul and yeah, well, Costa Rica has over 900 species of birds. So wow. if you're interested, it's and they're, yeah, yeah. So I enjoy that, and it takes you to all kinds of different habitats because, um, you know, bir birds are adapted to various places. Right now, some of the migrants are moving from north and headed back through going south. Mm. Starts the late August and um, you know goes right up until December. Doesn't Nyman have a butterfly thing? What's going on? Just well we're, we're trying to uh, create habitat specifically for the monarch butterfly. Uh, the monarch butterfly you know it's the orange and black uh, fairly uh, you know most everybody knows what it is but the, the population has dropped off 90%. Wow. And the host plant is a, a various species of milkweeds. And if everybody has a little habitat here and there, and if we can, we can uh, cut down on insect spraying, perhaps we can make some progress into bringing back this species. So not just the monarch, but uh, if, if, uh, if I go out you know, right now into the prairie, uh, I will see uh, different butterfly species, and I, I have to admit I'm not as good as I should be at identifying all of them. Some of them are very small and so on, but if you have the habitat, things will be there. Great. Okay, so what advice would you give a young farmer who wanted to start raising hogs today? Nyman Ranch, we have some incentives for young farmers, and even we've even given away free breeding stock and so on. But uh, Nyman Ranch and the way we raise pigs is something you can start with on a small scale uh, as opposed to the factory farm where you would have to go out and put up a building for a, a half a million dollars or something. So you can do this without getting yourself into a great amount of debt and you can, you can build your herd and, and grow, um, uh, you know, organically, if, if you will. 
And, and uh, on the website, nymanranch.com, you can find out information about how to be a Nyman farmer. Our farmers, uh, average age, 43 or something like that. That's gone. And farmers in general are 59 and a half. And, and you know, the number, the age of our farmers continues to kind of go, go down. We have, a lot, we have a lot of people that have just begun and they're, they're young people. That's and fantastic. We don't, pay, That's... We, don't, we don't pay commodity price. We pay you a, fa a fair price, something you can actually make some money at. Yeah, that's great to know because I know that the there's a crisis in just farmers. Like so many farmers are aging, and they're not being replaced. So it's good to hear that there are young people getting into farming and able to make a living off of it. Yeah, and it, it I would say it. You start out; it's an enterprise. You probably do something else. You might even have another job someplace, or maybe you're have, doing other things. You might be raising or milking cows or, or, or having beef or something. Um, so a diversified farm is kind of a series of enterprises. If one thing isn't doing really well, the other one might be, you know, right. you, you, you have more eggs in, in your basket. Right. So is there anything else you'd like to share with us? Well, Diane, you, you know, we're, we're having our virtual Nyman Ranch Hog Farmer Appreciation Dinner. Uh, it's going on up through the 11th of November, and there's all kinds of different activities. You can go to the website and find out. And there are panels that people can tune into. Uh, some of the topics have been the future of restaurants, future of grocery stores, uh, the re resilience of different types of, of food systems which I'm going to be on with Michael Pollan and, and uh, Don Sherman, who is uh, the CEO of Tonka, which is uh, a, a company that we're, we've been working with to help. And they are, uh, ma they're making products uh, raised by Native Americans and they're uh, bison products, I guess you would say. Mm. Three of us will be on, on September 8th. So we would certainly welcome anybody to tune in. September 8th. So I think it's right before or after. What okay. time? 12 noon central. Okay. So people who can go right from this directly. So switch over now, everyone, to Paul's other panel. Anyway, it's a 22nd year. Uh, we're, we're doing the, the farmer appreciation dinner and we have chefs, they're known worldwide in many cases, preparing different uh, courses. Diane, you've been to the dinner. Mm -hmm. And then there's awards and scholarships where we have a lot of scholarships for the students that are uh, the uh, family members of our Nyman farmers. And uh, anyway, just, just, just mentioning to, to make people aware, it's, it's become quite a thing. And, uh, a lot of farmers work really hard and uh, nobody really ever say, says thank you and honors them and in, in, at least in this way. Yeah, no, it's a fantastic meal. Our whole table one year, we're like New Yorkers and we were all crying by the end of it because it's so moving to watch the farmer. No, it is. It's very moving. But anyway, Paul, thank you so much for joining us and I will see you on those panels and hopefully I can get to Iowa soon and see you, see you. We would... Uh, I'll take you on a tour of the prairie. Yay. Thanks, That's Paul. That's uh, plenty of social distancing <laughs> options there. True, true. Okay, thank you very much. Thanks, Diane. Thank you, Paul Willis, and thank you so much to all of you for joining us. Next week, we have Sonia Trom Eris from Dodge County Concerned Citizens. She's going to actually go into depth about patchy farming, which Paul just mentioned in his interview, and what's happening in places like Illinois and the Midwest. So if you want to sign up for reminders for the show, just go to Change Foods Eventbrite page and follow us. Um, the link will be below in the description. And you can also watch past shows on our website, changefood.org, link also in the description, or on the Change Food YouTube channel. I'm also in a program note we are going to be doing interviews the first and third Tuesday of every month. And the plan is to still do something every Tuesday. Join us. Until next week, everyone, eat well.
Thank you.